You're listening to the Doug Stanhope Podcast. Hello, welcome out. Hope you're uh, hope you're doing well sitting there wherever you're sitting. We have with us Chad Shank is back. Greg Chaley's here, and our guest is uh, Chris Charles Scott, a documentarian. He's filming a, a documentary down here. Just released a uh, class action suit uh, that we talked about. Class action park. Park. <laughs> class action park. park that we, yeah. We've already talked about it on. Which HBO Max tweeted this morning that we are the number one uh, ranked movie in the nation, number one on their platform as well. Fantastic. So, yeah. it, it was good. We He screened it here for us. Uh, that was dope. It was, because you, uh, you set up an actual screen with a projector. We were going to settle for 55 inches on the patio, but no. No. No, no the, the no. neighbors were watching that two streets away. No, no. We we wanted the big screen. 55 inches is not enough to get the job done. Let's, we'll get back to the, 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 the movies, but uh, you just started with a question, and I said, save it, and we'll open with it. So, I just want to present this to my crew here. So, there's this girl who I met on a on a job. She was a client. And we kind of hit it off. But she's so mean. She's so mean. She says the meanest things to me. And so the other day she was like, uh, you overpromise and underdeliver. I said, do you mean that professionally or personally? And she said, dealer's choice. About five minutes before this podcast, her boss, who we did the, the production of videos for, was like, you did a fantastic job. We loved what you did. I just wanted to call you personally. So can I text this girl? Your boss just called me and 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 she thinks differently than what you thought. So fuck you. Can I say yeah, fuck you? Yeah, no, absolutely. You? I, I I would there's a million ways to say fuck you. Take take a second and write it in a, a very backhanded fuck you. I want to I want to write it as we sit here tonight. I want <laughs> this to go down in real time. Wait, Doug, we We've got the answer. It's your your celebrity phone call. <laughs> bad, bad news from bad a celebrity. Bad news from a celebrity. <laughs> bad news from a celebrity. That, that was a segment we were going to do in this <laughs> pilot we were shooting where if you have to fire someone or dump someone, hey, wouldn't they take the news better if they it got it from, from a yeah, yeah. <laughs> Drew Barrymore. <laughs> oh, my God. Let's, uh, let's get drunk and do that. <laughs> I will do that. I will do that. Yeah, I'll prank all of it, but I'm not a celebrity to her. <laughs> oh, I didn't mean you, Doug. We might find someone. <laughs> we could probably do a... He's got phone numbers. Nickelback will do it. Yeah, well, Nick, Nickelback. Mike, Nickelback, Nickelback Mike. <laughs> and this girl is so mean, she would be a Nickelback fan. <laughs> We're Nickelback fans. Oh, well, we, we know the bass we're, player. We're also pretty mean, so yeah, I think that was pretty yeah. apt. That was apt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, he's too nice to do something like that. Yeah. Shaylee cooked for us the other night, and it was delicious. Yeah, I think. Uh, I, but we were so faded the night before. I think everyone assumed someone else was cooking. But I, in hindsight, <laughs> I, I, I do I think saying. I did say Shaylee will cook. I did, by chance, get a huge bag of that mesquite charcoal, not knowing that, that it was going to take a lot of that to to get it going. Yeah, so it was. It just ended up we we had everything here, and it was good to go. I uh, I pride myself on my hosting skills, but I didn't know that I was going to be on camera first at ten thirty in the morning. I don't do anything without drinking. So uh, if I'm up first, all right, I'm drinking at ten thirty in the Answer morning. Answer the door. He's got to be drunk. So. Yeah. Are, are we getting into this? Because I, so after we finish filming any project, we have like a, like a debrief with the, uh, with the, the crew and uh, three of my four crewmen loved your interview the best. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Bingo was the I thought Bingo breakout. Was, was the breakout star. Yeah. Will be the breakout star. The audience will <coughs> love Bingo. I, I did not know. This is not knock on bingo. I did not know that she was capable of that type of emotion and that type of storytelling. I mean, she just absolutely nailed it. Yeah. Uh, if if you didn't hear the last podcast, this is the uh, the 
podcast about nowhere man and a whiskey girl, the people from the famous cliffhanger podcasts uh, that uh, died and then committed suicide in short order. Uh, so I know I, I, the videos I saw, Chad and Joby, uh, Bingo, and after that, uh, anyone really interesting? Yes, and I want to uh, I want to fact check something that, that Jimmy Derek, G's, oh, well, oh Derek's mom said. Okay, not Jimmy G, but Derek's mom. Uh, nowhere man, nowhere man. Yeah, nowhere man. Nowhere man's mom said that Derek committed suicide in the same room where your mother's assisted suicide. No, took place. different houses. Okay. That was in this main house where you were filming Bingo. That's where Mother's Bed was, and you saw where Nowhere Man was. Okay. I was like, how did I miss that? Like, I, I there's no way I missed that. But but she she said that that's what happened. I was like, mm. I, I can see where, that. yeah, but she, we weren't close to her. She wasn't, like, hanging around here. Yeah. Uh, so she might have heard that it happened in, I mean, it's, it's they're different houses, but in Doug's the same compound, the same. basically. It's all... Yeah, it's connected. Yeah. Okay. See, I can see where that mistake would be made, <clears throat> yeah, for yeah. sure. But she she is convinced that it was in the same actual room. Uh, Not so much. Yeah. Okay. Different house. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I just want to get my facts straight. <clears throat> yeah, Bingo was the only one that was there for both, so maybe we should... Come on in. Is she here? Is she around? Uh, no, she's got a friend that's just coming into town, uh, okay. so... I like Bingo. Yeah, that was a... So so, go ahead. So that was one. Um, Jimmy G cried, um, and that was a powerful moment. I did not think that he would do that, uh, but uh, there's going to be some. There's going to be a lot of fact checking in this documentary. But the story that we've 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 discovered about Nowhere Man and Whiskey Girl. I, I cannot believe no one has done a documentary about this before. Um, and we talked to a couple of the Breams, uh, Jessica and Mark Bream. They live over in Vail, Arizona. Uh, they were in a band called The Briefcase, The Briefcases or Briefcase with Nowhere Men and a Whiskey Girl, Derek and Amy Ross, before they were Nowhere Men and Whiskey Girl. And they, those, that couple, were very intimate with with uh nowhere man and whiskey girl and uh they were almost the first people we interviewed that took not a not an anti amy side but but most of the people we spoke with they were very saint amy amy was yeah. amazing amy was awesome she could do no wrong but they gave us a very pragmatic uh, viewpoint on it. They said this is not a Romeo and Juliet story. They said because if the if the if the roles were reversed and if it was Derek who was dying of lupus and had died of lupus, Amy was not going to come home and kill herself. No, no, <laughs> she'd be playing right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They said Derek loved Amy way more than Amy loved him, and so that was that was the first perspective. <laughs> um with that angle. Uh, and I thought that was very interesting that it was no longer St. Amy, but I spoke with Jimmy G in our pre-interview and he said, don't make them angels. They were real people and flawed people. Um, I don't want to give away my whole movie, but yeah. there's infidelity, there's uh, illness, there's death and more death. And so I, I cannot believe that I'm the first documentarian that's, ever thought about doing a documentary about these two people uh i i know well i want you to tell a story about how you found out about it but i was also curious you're not uh you're a a east texas guy i so how did you know about uh class action park i was born in east texas like on the louisiana border like 533 people were in my town like my dad is a slave still uh and wait that's still legal Apparently there, like I told them about eight years ago, there was a black guy as president and I was run out of town. Um, so it's it's a very isolated place. And so I found out about Action Park 
the same way I found out about Nowhere Man and Whiskey Girl. Like when people hear that you make documentaries, they have two responses. A, I have a story for you that you won't believe. And B, you should do a documentary about me. Um, <laughs> and both of those concepts are incredibly shitty concepts. Uh, everyone thinks that they dress better than they do. Everyone thinks that they're funnier than what they are. And people think that they're more interesting than what they are. And so I've never done a, a documentary on someone going, you should do a documentary on me, like 0%. But we, we get that in comedy all the time. If you hung around with me and my friends at the office, you'd have a whole oh, new yeah, skit. Yeah, you get a reality my show. My bowling team that. is so <laughs> yeah, funny. We are, we are a bunch of live wires, right? <laughs> like, no. No, uh, my coworker has the coffee mug that says, "Why? Well, it's so hard to soar with the eagles when you work with the turkeys." <laughs> You'd love her. Oh, I have a friend. I'm not gonna call his name, but he thinks he's funny simply because he says the word "fuck" in a story. It's like, so I went down to the fucking Walmart, and there's this fucking person with the fucking and ha ha, right? I'm funny, right? I'm like, no, no, you're not funny or interesting. And so, okay. um, but I have done documentaries based on people and friends telling me, hey, would this make a great documentary? And my good friend, Seth Porges, he's a journalist. Uh, he was in Vegas, which where I live. And we just got together for drinks one night at a steakhouse called STK in the Cosmopolitan of Las Vegas. And we were just sitting at the bar. And he goes, man, I have a, a, a wild story that I did an article on a few years ago. And he told me the story. I was like, yes, <laughs> we can make this a documentary. That was around April 27th and Memorial Day. We were on the ground that same year. It was a few weeks later. We were on the ground in New Jersey filming. And so... Same with Nowhere Man and Whiskey Girl. I was doing the blackest thing. I'm black, by the way, for your podcast audience. Um, I was doing the blackest thing ever when I found out about Nowhere Man and a Whiskey Girl. I was golfing at a country club, <laughs> and the person who I was golfing with was like, I have a story for you. It's around the eighth hole. Around the tenth hole, I was like, I'm doing this story. I said, if, you, if what you're telling me is absolutely true, then this would make a great documentary. I went home. I rushed home after that, like literally rushed home because I was like, there's because I was Googling on my phone. Nowhere Man with your documentary just to make sure I say this story is that good. Someone had someone's done it. Someone's done it. And no one had done it. And the story, his facts were wrong. The The story that my buddy told me, he said that Amy went into the hospital, died, uh, nowhere man, Derek, called uh, Amy's parents and said that she's just fine, and he went to a hotel and killed himself in Tucson. That's the story that I got, and, and I found that interesting. But the actual story is far more interesting than that. Like So the, the story that hooked me to this story was not even like the best part of this story. The actual truth is the best part of this story. And I cannot believe, I cannot believe that I scored. This is like winning the lottery or being <laughs> white. Like this is, this is like, <laughs> this is like the, I love, this is the greatest thing ever. Uh, and so, yeah, here we are. That happened in July and here we are. Wow. The the idea, not the uh, yeah. not the event. Yeah, for chat. <laughs> just for people yeah. who are just catching up on the podcast. The event was years ago. It seems to me that like when you find it, when you like you're doing a little bit of like beginning research, that everyone has it wrong or different would make it like, oh, this is going to be good because if no one's got it right, there's a lot to go around. Like there's like myth and yes. like all this other stuff. It seems like yeah. Did you perfect. run into any of that? Because I was surprised when you said that. Bingo's story lined up with the mother's story. Yes. Uh, Bingo's story lined up with Derek's mom's story. Two eyewitnesses, right? They were well, Bingo's ha since had a traumatic brain injury That's and her facts oh, are all shit. wrong. And I oh. heard the mother's goofy, so I figured her facts might be wrong. Well, it <laughs> might be two goofy people. <laughs> they might have both got it wrong the same <laughs> way. <laughs> <laughs> it it <laughs> just might be two goofy people, but like these two goofy people 
if they were if they were about if they were being interrogated and, and about to go to prison, they would be let go because they're like both stories check out. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> You both couldn't have made up this story. Right. So, yeah. So, um, bingo story checked out. But also, the myths. Like, you got to kind of keep some of these myths in there, right? Uh, because um, there's are, there are some parts of the story that contradict other parts of the story. Um, like, Jimmy G thought... he gave Jimmy G gave us a story that... Um, Derek Nowhere Man was not in the room when Amy had died. That he was in Bisbee and he had to drive over to Bisbee, uh, drive from Bisbee to Tucson by himself. And he could imagine the pain and the the worry that was going on through his mind when uh, a family member was like, "That's not what happened." Like Derek was in the room. Nowhere Man was in the room, uh, and which made this we had an on staff fact checker. Because uh, Amy's whiskey girl's uh, brother-in-law, Jeremy, is a film professor in Wyoming, and he graduated from the Sundance Institute, won an award for his uh, screenwriting. I was like, I gotta bring this guy on my my crew. Yeah, and so a lot of people didn't know that that a family member of Amy, Whiskey Girl, was actually on our crew. And so they're just telling stories and blah, blah, blah. And so after every interview, Jeremy had a list that was like, bullshit, that didn't bullshit, 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 <laughs> bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. But I started to get annoyed by that because my better stories were all bullshit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was like, you know, eh, this, we're going to let this one slide, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, Derek did have a four-foot penis, right? So I got, I have to I have to keep that in there. Uh, so, um, but, but, but Jeremy was our, our, our on-staff bullshit detector. Yeah. Uh, Jimmy G is a, uh, a guy that you will never hear. Uh, I don't really remember. Or I'm not sure. He'll just make something up. <laughs> but Jimmy G, oh, brother. <laughs> He's a storyteller. Can he tell a story? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Can he tell a story? Um, he was worried about, um, he goes, man, I used to be skinny and in shape and very good looking. Now I'm big. And what angle are you going to shoot me from? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you can show up early and we can put you at the angle that you want. Uh, but he showed up, sat down. I guess he was okay with the angle. And man, did he <laughs> open up? Oh, he was, he was, he was good. He was good. Jimmy, uh, for the, good. for the listener, Jimmy G picture, a uh, a big bloated. And I've heard he's gotten way bigger. Colonel Parker with kind of a, <laughs> Long, too long hair for his Elvis, age. Sixty. That's the, that's the reference you're going. <laughs> no, Elvis's manager, <laughs> like a cowboy hat, <laughs> big and slovenly, and uh, you know, an answer for everything. But, but <laughs> with but, a 22 year old girlfriend, that exactly. seems like she's been drugged. <laughs> exactly. So Jimmy G, Jimmy G might be a uh, uh, a yarn spinner. Um, colloquial southern phrase there <laughs> and he might be slightly overweight ish um but man that guy he has to have a mouthpiece because so i've met at least one of the girls he's dated that's like 20 years his junior that i would i would shoot my shot at <laughs> <laughs> and and when i was and when i met this girl and this is no offense to both Jimmy or the girl. I was like, if she slept with Jimmy, like, I, and need, that's I like need to throw in a hard bid. <laughs> <laughs> I need to throw in a hard bid. Here. But, uh, but yeah, Jimmy, I can, I can definitely see the appeal of of Jimmy, very, very charismatic storyteller. He reminds me of all the the men. Uh, from my little small town, we didn't have electricity or decency, uh, and uh, <laughs> and these guys would just spin these tales on the porch, and I just remember uh, he he reminded he gave me that same sort of vibe there. Um, we met Floyd. Yeah, oh, Floyd. No. I hope Floyd's listening to this. Floyd, you were my least impressive interview. Uh, <laughs> 
floor and you gave us nothing. And I thought, and, and Doug said that, oh, this guy's funny. He's a comedian. The funniest thing he said was his stage name. It was Phil DeVoy. Phil yep. DeVoy, yeah. And, and I, I thought that He's was, performed in this room. Really? Yeah. I, I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> and he had this sort of drunkish look to him. I was like, this is about to be a great interview. And then I was like, Floyd, you know, say something funny. He's like, I'm like, what, what, tell us what you know about Bisbee. I, sh- I should have been there to lead him a bit. You should have, I man. Should have. Uh, you should have. I don't think he's going to make the cut. Floyd, you're not going to make the cut. <laughs> but just preliminary, I don't think Floyd's going to make the cut. But, I mean, people who are listening to this, like across the country, Bisbee is full of characters. Um, and what makes great documentaries, you got to have a good baseline story, right? But you got to have, like, these fantastic, colorful, outspoken characters that are both insane but insane to the point where people will relate to them and fall in love with them. Chad here <laughs> was one of our better interviews. Uh, very, uh, I don't know if we want to go into it, but very... Listeners of this podcast probably know the story that Chad and Joby had to clean up after the, uh, the suicide. After the suicide. Um, and, and, and discussing your own demise uh, by way of suicide. Um, and, and as you guys all know, my family currently is dealing with the suicide of my nephew very recently. I mean, we're just completely devastated still. And you were the last one to talk to him. Yeah. And, and we're just completely devastated. And, and that also gives me perspective into this story about how the people that we have talked with, it seems like we are. I won't say we're healing wounds here, but there's a lot of people whose feelings are still hurt. There are a lot of people who still don't understand, who don't get this. And just by us coming down here and connecting dots and really getting the whole story, because there's a lot of people, Doug, people were talking, there were people talking shit about you that don't know the whole story, that don't know that Derek asked you to write that Facebook post. They just thought Doug is an asshole. <laughs> He, he doesn't know how else to do it. And so he's going to go on Facebook and be an asshole and announce Amy's death. Like, if people are raw about that, and it's, I didn't correct them on the spot because I want them to see the yeah. documentary. Oh, that's awesome. And yeah. be like, you're wrong. Like, yeah. I was wrong. Like, Doug did not do that on, on his own. And yeah, people were saying, like, I hacked her account. Like, yeah, I, yeah. I don't even know how to get into my own Facebook on my new computer, <laughs> much less someone else's. <laughs> to, to, to somehow crack her code to, to get in her password. But, yeah. but among this story, the most misunderstood villain of this story is Stanhope. Um, <laughs> Yeah. That and is, a lot of people That's our brand actually. Like, yeah. Yes. <laughs> I, I, and, none and, of us look shocked in the room <laughs> right now. <laughs> but, but but from from my from my psychoanalysis they're also jealous that Doug and Bingo had such proprietary access to them right before this happened. Yeah. Well, people are like, if only, if that was me with him that day, I could have saved him. Or if, if that was me who had, had the chance to sit with him before he went, I tried to call him, but he wouldn't answer his phone. And a lot of people's feelings are hurt. People who are like, who are like closely connected with these two individuals <laughs> who thought that, oh, I'm their best friend. Right. And so they had a knack for making everyone feel like you're the only person in my world. You're the only person in my world. And then after their, their untimely deaths so close together, people were so hurt that they weren't involved. Well, in in the death story. Oh, and they need a villain to blame why they weren't involved. Yes. Oh, I get it. Amy had that quality as a performer, like a titty dancer quality of making eye contact with you, making you think she's singing that song just for you. In just a you know a few seconds of eye contact, you go, "Oh shit, this is all about me," and she she carried that into her regular life with people. Yeah, I there was a story that came out that um, 
they would tell people they were brothers and sisters because so many of the guys at the shows wanted to fuck Amy. And uh, it was good business. And so they were like, hey, we're brothers and sisters. And dudes were like, oh, okay. Like, yes, chin. I will buy your t shirt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, clever. Don't hate the game. <laughs> Don't hate the game. Did yeah, you uh, did you get uh, Jimmy Eat World or? Uh, yeah, we we spoke with Jim Atkins and Robin right. Vining, uh, and um. What about Courtney? Courtney Andrews is going to be the narrator of this oh, documentary. Yeah. Who, who's that? Great. She's uh she came up with them, and now she's a big Nashville. Star, I guess you'd say. Whis- Whiskey's family has a connection to not only being very talented, but a connection in the music industry. There's a, there's a brother who's a, he's like a Grammy award winning writer. Yes. Correct? Yes. yes. Um, uh, in Nashville, yeah. I believe. Um, but as musically talented as Amy's family was, Derek did not come from much. Yeah. We'll be with Amy's Whiskey Girls family in Wyoming in a couple of weeks, but uh, I'm not going to cry here. Uh, but uh, but Derek's family, they were um, just the nicest people. Um, and they invited us into their home, which was probably no bigger than this room that we're in and they were the most generous and they were the most nicest <clears throat> people ever and listening to them tell their story and how they got over Derek's suicide in the ways they've not gotten over Derek's suicide sort of laid a blueprint for me and my family of how do we move on from this but I'm telling you man these people are living in Douglas, Arizona, which is the not uh, scenic, <laughs> not scenic, not, not prosperous, not prosperous. Thirty minutes from here, about yeah, you know, we're, we're uh, on the, it's, it's the uh, southeast corner of Arizona on the Mexican border, and it's bleak. The, bleak. the port of entry there is the only reason why that's still a town. Ag- Agua yeah. Prieta. Yeah. yeah. The uh, they said we have Derek here. And they pulled out Derek's ashes, oh. and it was still in the same box that you get when the funeral home delivers it to you, when the crematorium delivers it to you. And I said, Ken, I said, I would love to buy him an urn. And her face lit up, and she looked at the box, and she goes, Derek, we're finally going to get you get you in peace. Um, I said, do you want a traditional urn? She goes, no, he was a kooky person like make this as kooky as possible but man the the earnestness of those people the 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 audience of this documentary they're going to fall in love with Derek's family This has nothing to do with our relationship, but I was holding Mr. Squishles, and he leaned into a kiss, and I didn't lean away. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, everybody. It's me, Brett Erickson, from the Issues with Andy podcast. Uh, We love you, Killer Termites, and we hope you'll tune in and uh, check us, Issues with Andy, on uh, YouTube. Yeah, it's not a podcast, right? Isn't it a bod- vodcast? You're right. For once, Andy, you're right. It's a vodcast, which means it's a podcast it. fueled by vodka. <laughs> if you love the shit you're getting here on the Doug Stanhope podcast, get more shit with us on Issues with Andy on YouTube every Friday. And yeah, we'll, you keep listening and watching or however you do it, and we'll keep shitting. Do you have a title yet? Nowhere Man and a Whiskey Girl. All right. Yeah. I want to honor their... People knew them by that. Yeah. That's, that was their brand. And we were talking to their former band, The Briefcase, Sis, Sis, Sai, Briefcase Sai, uh, <laughs> um, Briefcase Um uh, So they were... They said it was just time for us to break up because nowhere man in a whiskey girl, they, they had to go do their own thing. They wanted to live that gypsy life. 
Um, they wanted to go and just make money off of these gigs here and <coughs> gigs here. And, and they that, just wanted a gig. That's just, they just wanted a gig. And, um, and that was them. That was them. I kept trying to find like sort of this, why didn't they make it? And, and I'm telling my whole documentary here. Uh, how many people listen to this? I don't know. <laughs> less and less. Okay. Um, <laughs> Um, Norman and Whiskey Girl, people know them by that brand. And one of the things that we want to do, the art that was on their Nowhere Man and Whiskey Girl, that album's cover, uh, my animator, who's brilliant, Richard Landberg in Las Vegas, um, he's going to, there are parts where we're going to have to animate. And we're going to use that sort of Southwest motif art to do that. And so nice. we just love the, just to call it Nowhere Man and a Whiskey Girl. But for a lot of the nation, um, they will be discovering this dynamic duo for the very first time. You're going to be clicking on HBO or Netflix or whatnot. You see Nowhere Man and a Whiskey Girl. You're going to be like, what? Who? I'm telling you. I, when I was leaving Bisbee, after we finished filming last week, it's dark. It's a Saturday night. I'm driving from Bisbee to Tucson, and you go to that magical tunnel outside of town, and I just, I put on tumbleweed, and they gave me my story. They gave me my ending. They gave me my story. I didn't know that. I'm 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 discovering them through this documentary and through the people who knew them and hung out with them. Derek sat at this very bar um before he killed himself. And um just the spirit, they're all around this place. Um uh, and so I, I, I feel this kindredness with them. Um and I, I I'm not I'm not one to talk like this. But I think that they are helping me tell their story. Um, this documentary, I have gotten every fucking break that I've needed. Every break. Uh, Charlotte and Barbara down in Douglas, uh, Nowhere Man's uh, mother and, mother and sister. sister. I kept trying to call them. And they would not respond. And then Charlotte finally picks up last week. Charlotte is stage four colon cancer. Uh, they stopped they they have stopped therapeutic treatment and they've just palliative care. Not quite palliative care, but they're just trying to shrink the tumor. All right. Palliative care is Hot that's pain management. It's next. And, yeah. It's next. Uh, she will hospice. I don't want to to jinx it. <laughs> It, 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 and I asked her, I said, Charlotte, how long do you have? She goes, they're not giving me a, a time period, but she goes, I'm going to try to fight this thing and beat this thing. I said, but they're not trying to treat the tumor. She goes, I know. Um, she is not, I don't want to say this, but I, but just basic science. Uh, her, her prognosis is grim. Um, and, uh, I went to, uh, and, and she call, she told me, she goes, I've been going through cancer treatments. Apologies for not answering your call. And then we talked on the phone. I said, I would love to come to your house and interview you. She gave me the address. And she We made a time. And I was so nervous that they were not going to, they were going to, I, I hear they've been very difficult in this whole process that in the death, in the funeral, that Amy Stanley wasn't invited to the wedding or the funeral. Uh, Amy Stanley, they warned me like they might be difficult. Yeah. And so on the eve of their interview, I call them uh, and call them and call them and call them. And I was like, fuck, 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 fuck. This is about to turn into an Amy Ross documentary. But I had no one yeah. to speak for Derek. And we drove down to Douglas on a hunch and a prayer. And we knocked on the door. They're like, hey, we've been expecting you guys. I'm like, wow. 
<laughs> every break that we have needed, every person from Courtney Andrews to Jim Atkins of Jimmy World to Doug. Doug, I emailed you from an email I found on the internet, and two hours later, you and I were on the telephone. That's because you were, did the smart thing and included a link to a New York Times article about your last documentary that was just coming out. <laughs> a million people say, I, I, wanted, I, I want to write an autobiography of them or I want uh, or a biography of them. And like, who are you? Have you ever written a book before? No, but you, ha- you were inspired. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Um, Every break, um, and I'm not. A did you get a uh, Papa Joe? I did not do Papa uh, Joe. Was that a? Was that a? He has footage. He, he filmed the uh, when they played the wall for Bingo when we first had him over. Well, I will who's, contact who's him Papa and get Joe? the footage. He was a super fan. Okay, I guess I met him when I met Courtney Marie Andrews. She was Whiskey Girls' opening act up at uh, uh, Pinos Altos. Oh, at the, the, the cabins. The, we go to the cabin. Yeah, well, it's the Longhorn. The restaurant is the only restaurant. It's the only restaurant, and we were up there just on vacation, and they happened to be playing at the only bar. I think when I met Courtney Marie Andrews, I was boiling the skull of something I'd found dead on that hiking trail when I was walking the dogs. <laughs> oh, so, so here's another thing about this documentary and 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 this whole Bisbee world that Nowhere Man and Whiskey Girl not only existed in they. I think they fucking ruled here. Here's another aspect that we found here in Bisbee. So, um, Derek's funeral um, was at the Episcopal Church here. I called the the rector of the church, and I was like, hey, can we film inside your church? He was like, I'm going to have to take this to my bishop, and it has to go before a committee. We want to maintain and protect our sacred space. What is this for? I said, we're doing a documentary on Nowhere Man and Whiskey Girl. Oh, yeah. Come oh, on now. Yeah. yeah. Fuck yeah. <laughs> like, dude, lead with that, yo. Yo, he goes, let's do this. Yeah, he goes, man, I almost nunchucked you. Like, <laughs> uh-huh. uh, The funeral home where... Um, um, his body was cremated and prepared for cremation. Is a, it sounds like a one man <laughs> operation, and probably we, in this time. And we called him, and he was like, uh, "And this is this also goes to show you where we, this gives you perspective of where we are in the country." He's like, "I can't meet you at the funeral home today. I'm out in the desert picking up the body of someone who was trying to cross the border." That just died in the middle of the yeah. desert. That's a whole nother story because that that didn't freak me out, but it really it, it gave me like fuck, like this shit is real. Like y'all, I'm not gonna get into politics. But this shit is people are losing their lives trying to get into this country. That's a tangent. Funeral director, hey, can we come film the chapel where the family viewed his body for? right after he died and the coroner and the funeral director advised the family don't no, no. you don't want to open that bag you don't want to open that bag so when they got to the funeral home the the funeral director just had his arm out so they could just hold his arm and whatnot and it was a very very sacred very moving very intimate time with the family and Derek's body that both barbara and charlotte in their um, their interviews, they let me know that that happened. And I said, oh, I would really love to get to film the inside of that funeral chapel. And we're like, can we film? We know you're out, like, collecting the body of Mexicans in the desert. But could you, could we, could we, could we see, can, we, can you let us in? He's like, man, I live all the way in Douglas. I ain't trying to come up to Bisbee. We're like... All right, so uh, we were just we just needed to shoot the chapel because that's where Derek Ross's body was, and his family spoke of that being an intimate moment. He goes, "What? Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah." Hit me tomorrow. I'll meet you guys up there tomorrow. Like we were eating lunch at the High Desert uh, Market, and our crew is just talking about how B roll went, how interviews went, and a guy is eating slowly. And I can tell he's listening. 
<laughs> I can tell he's listening. And then he walks up to us. He goes, I would like to recite to you a lyric that someone wrote about them. And it was like something about rain and pain and, and whatnot. But, but uh, arms and charms, arms, charms, uh, hippity hop bop. Uh, and he can he, he, this guy, he, he stood at our table and recited this lyric like with tears in his eyes. I was like, they really meant a lot to this town. Um, and whenever I needed something done here, I just dropped, hey, I'm doing a documentary on Over Man and Whiskey Girl. They're like, well, there's a table right here for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The Frank Sinatra of Bisbee. Yeah. Also, I thought I was like, I'm about to drive into a small, racist ass <laughs> Joe. <laughs> Arab or whatever is his Arpaio. name, a, a Joe Apio type of town, and I drive up and like every bit I've seen no black person, I've seen more Black Lives Matter signs than actual black people. <laughs> so, oh <my> God. Yeah, <laughs> you're not gonna see any either. I can tell you. Yeah, that. But where are the black I lives? Sh- I got Shawnee on the phone and he promised to come and he didn't show up. For no, the, yeah. So the screening. So, uh, so Doug and I, first night I'm at Doug's house, I was like, where are the black lives? And he's like, I know a black life. I was like, present this black life. <laughs> and he calls up his buddy. What's his name? Sean uh, Hicks. Sean Hicks. Shawnee. He was like, uh, uh, can you come over to my house? This is black documentarian <laughs> here. He doesn't believe you exist. And the guy was like, yeah, I'll come. And so we're here the next day. He doesn't come yeah. on time. Typical, right? No, he didn't I, come I, at I, all. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I, no I, I remember he didn't show. I said, at least our our black people don't show up at all, not just late. Yeah, you know, they don't even show up late. They don't even show up. Like, so this this shiny this, this guy might exist. He might not exist. But I tell you, I have counted like eight Black Lives Matter signed and like zero Black Lives. And right across the street is my neighbor Bruce. Yeah. He's black, you, and I I, go, I went over me there. About these people like it. Well, I, went, I I haven't seen them the unicorns. whole time you were here, and yeah, they're I, unicorns. I went over to give. Oh, you know what I gave him is the cake because he's got kids. Uh, I that gave was him, my fucking cake. Yeah, well, it would have been spoiled by now. So I brought it. No one touched it that night. Uh, Valentina brought it so I brought it over to him because I heard uh, him talking over there and he comes out on crutches all fucked up I'm like that's why I haven't seen him he's he's, he's all fucked up so the one black person here is maimed yes yes yes. you guys like your black people down here in theory (laughs) in theory you guys we're not recruiting (laughs) (laughs) There's no scholarship here. Yeah, so yeah. What's, a, what's a black person have to come for? Yeah. Bisbee needs to openly recruit black people. Yeah. <laughs> but the white people are here. They're pretty good. <laughs> pretty, uh, but but the, no, I the first night I was here, the first day I was here, the first morning, we're at the Bisbee Coffee Company. Is that the name of it? And I'm sitting up sending emails off, and a lady behind me is like, Donald Trump is the nicest man in the world, and the government is using radio waves to... I'm like, yeah. what? I'm like, where am I? Where am I? It's a mixture of Black Lives Matter people, um, I assume you guys are woke, um, and the people who believe that Trump is a great father and cares about people. Bisbee is pretty... Neutral, balanced. balanced, I would say, for Arizona. But if you just have to accidentally venture into Tombstone, that's a different story. So yeah, <laughs> Tombstone still, sounds so, racist. Sometimes I forget that I'm in Arizona <laughs> yeah. because I don't go places. And then you yeah. stop at a bar in Tombstone, and like you said, there's just coronavirus is a hoax. Just yeah. yelling at the bar, and you're like, oh, fuck, that's yeah. cool, yeah. man. It's, and Sierra Vista, Sierra Vista is a different kind of conservative. That's military conservative. <laughs> uh, and Tombstone is, you know, every fucking idiot you see at Sturgis in a Trump shirt. Ooh. <laughs> I was going to peruse that town by myself Saturday. Oh, you should do it. Really? Yeah, yeah. Just I mean, it's... It, it, 
one block off in my Antifa shirt. It's a, well, yeah. I wouldn't do that. My Antifa tank top. Uh, <laughs> they won't give you shit about uh, the mask because they know your top's prone to it. Yeah. <laughs> He's high risk on two what levels. Yeah, on two levels. <laughs> I wish that wasn't an accurate yeah. description of that place. Yeah, they're, like, they're like, hide your wives. He might rape them or give them corona. Or in yeah, some yeah. cases, I've read both. Yeah, well, it's, a tourist, <laughs> it's a tourist town. He, he's so going gonna to smoke that uh, wacky weed with him and teach him jazz music. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, they, they're probably reports in Tombstone that there's a colored over there who can read. Yeah. <laughs> Making movies and such. Yeah. Well, we know what kind of movies you're making. We know what type of movie you're making. It's, uh, I mean, it, it, people here, I think a lot of them have opinions just as a form of entertainment. Or they have a, or a cause. That lady that would write into the Bisbee Observer letter to the editor every week just complaining about something susan black blackford where's the lady who was uh who was your villain in the uh the bag prohibition that's her oh yeah that's her. plastic bag yep. that was yeah. hilarious oh, yeah. yes yeah she was all pro plastic bags and anti-civil unions and just a constant complainer and that was her thing that was her Watching, you know, uh, soap operas. Everyone has a thing, so people here yeah, so, so have he, an uneducated opinion. Well, so, in addition to people moving to, you know, when I was in the army, the first time I said I was from Arizona, somebody's like, "People are from Arizona." I thought people only moved to Arizona, and I realized, oh, that's kind of true. But the people that are from here are usually in these little pocket mining towns, and they've never left that town or read a book, or you know. I want to befriend. Someone who was born and raised in Tombstone. That might be a documentary within <laughs> itself. Uh, sort of like Richard Pryor, the toy. Like, like I can yeah. be like their black friend, <laughs> and we can do <laughs> fun events together. <laughs> and speaking of fun events in Bisbee, here's the two <clears throat> things I've done. Right now, in Doug's fun house, is Bisbee in a nutshell. You have us doing this podcast, drinking, having a great time, and there's Tracy, Chaley's wife, knitting, like crochet like, to be crocheting, happy. like a foot away from me. Is while, while <laughs> bartendering. While, while bartendering, <laughs> we we call him Officer Bob Friendly now, and we don't give away his new appointed position. But uh, he would come in in uniform, and just to have Chad Shank and a cop in uniform, just. Shooting offering shit. offering yeah. security but uh, trading ideas about you know from different sides of the law yeah. and agreeing on a lot of stuff yeah. this is bingo you are listening to the Doug Stanhope podcast Um, so this, I, I, I must say, um, I've done a lot of documentaries and those documentaries have sent me to very strange places and I met a lot of strange people and this is not hyperbolic at all. Um, and for those who don't know what hyperbolic is. I was just going to do that for my white <laughs> listeners. Yeah, for, for your white <laughs> my, listeners. My listeners need help with big words. <laughs> yeah. I, I Don't you hate when people are condescending? Chad, that means when people talk down to you. Oh, I was about to explain it to you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, what were we talking about? You've done a lot hy- uh, of hyperbole. Uh, uh, hyperbole. A lot of documentaries. Um, the people that I've met here on this shoot, this town, um, this is, it's, it's driving through that tunnel, something really magical happens. I've been here two fucking weeks and I just extended my hotel. Uh, 
tonight. Like, will I leave? I don't know. Has Bisbee finally got a black person? Well, well, <laughs> Tune in next week. Hey. <laughs> Bingo's uh, Bingo's uh, friend Tark just bought a house down at the end of the street up one. Uh, that is a house I fucking love. Did you get the one? Get uh, yeah, and oh, he, wow. he actually had to go eleven thousand higher than their asking price to get it, and that's since you've been here. So he's a person of Middle Eastern color. Property values have gone up since you've been here. And they, uh, yeah. <laughs> where in the world does this happen that a no. person of Middle Eastern yeah. culture? Moves I'm, in I'm and the saying, property you just values. Just being around town with a camera that you own. <laughs> yeah, I bet. If, I, I bet if I move back in, uh, the home prices will stabilize. <laughs> like we we sort of cancel each other. We cancel each other out. Uh, uh, I'm starting. Do- I'm starting Bisbee NAACP. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You, you've been asking, where are the black people? Maybe you should be asking what happened to all what? the black people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, where do the black people hang out? I'm like, you see that tree? I'll give you a two-parter because I hate interviews with fucking superlative questions. Was there a, a documentary that 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 motivated you into going fuck I want to do that or has there been a documentary since you've been doing them that made you go ah fuck I still need to step up my game when I first started so um I'm I'm what you call a genius um <laughs> I, I, my first documentary that I ever we did we call it book smarts book smarts <laughs> that boy got some learning uh, <laughs> Uh, my first documentary I ever did was a, a, a four-part series called The Shape of Shreveport. It's about a little town where I grew up near that had this crazy, brilliant, wacky, and eclectic history. And I said, I'm going to make a documentary. And it was just floating. I quit my job. I'm about as broke as the Ten Commandments. I need <laughs> money. And OnlyFans did not exist then. Um, and so a buddy, I teamed you know, up with a buddy on Will Broyles down in Shreveport, and we did this four part documentary series on the history of Shreveport. This is my first documentary ever. And I won the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities Documentary of the Year for my first documentary. Nice, nice. And so it's just been an escalating career. Um, I've had weird stories. I've had stories where I'm like, mm, I'm really ready for this to be over. Uh, but in terms of making shitty and sucky documentaries, but is there a documentary that you've seen since you've been doing that? Oh, where that you go, I've seen that blew your mind. Like, oh fuck, yeah. Um, if you have Netflix, I think a few people do now. A few people have it's, Netflix. It's catching up to yeah. Quibi. Yeah, <laughs> if you have, if you, and we can talk about Quibi. What a mess. <laughs> uh, uh, if your girl, if your ex girlfriend still has not changed her password on her Netflix account, go and watch <laughs> The Last Chance You uh, uh, by a uh, uh, director Greg Whitley. Is that a thirty for thirty? It's not. It's a it's a documentary series. I think there are like five seasons now. That he it's an episodic series about he goes into these small ass towns that have like these major junior college football programs and it's the kid who got caught smoking weed at Auburn. Right. The kid who beat up his girlfriend at Texas Tech. They all have to go to these smaller colleges to like to rebuild their um um rebuild their worth and rebuild their division one status. And so you have like these world class athletes that with just shitty work ethics and drinking problems. I like you motion to me. Yeah, and, and, and they move into these these small j- j- scuba Mississippi, um, and I watch documentaries, and I'm like, yo, they could have done way better. Oh, uh, if I had that documentary, I would have done this. <laughs> That's the next question. Is but, but give but, me an example of one where you're like, come on, you had a great story and you fucking ruined it because I I. I've watched a lot of those where Ooh, what's a great story but you fucking ruined it. Um there's a documentary called The Bridge. 
Oh yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah man. Like, we're a big Every, documentary. Everybody Dude, comes I, alive I, on the I, suicide I, documentary. So, so, so the bridge for for the white listeners, the bridge, uh, and for black listeners as well, and for the one Middle Eastern guy in Bisbee, um, the bridge is a documentary about. So the Golden Gate Bridge is the number one destination on the planet where people commit suicide. So much so that the bridge authority, they've had to put up suicide nets. And before they put up suicide nets, they had... It's like they do for pigeons, like to try yeah, to keep to, to pigeons to keep off pigeons of... pigeons from shitting on yeah. the bridge. These nets keep, pe- keep people from jumping off the bridge and pigeons from shitting on it, um, which are both very virtuous things. Uh, <laughs> windshield if you don't get to right. it right away. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so um, this documentarian, I don't know his name, he he documented, he convinced the bridge authority that he was doing a documentary about the aesthetics of the bridge, and he set up cameras alongside, uh, along the bridge. In, in For the a full of the year. And he just, it, it's almost like daily. <laughs> yeah. He's catching people jumping off the bridge. You see people trying to catch them. Um and San Francisco, when it came out, flipped the fucking biscuit. Flip the going, biscuit. Well, you said it was about the Golden Gate Bridge. Yeah, and the people and jumping the people off it. the people jumping off of it. The director's Eric Steele. Eric Steele. Yeah. Um, Is that a porn star? It, it, that does sound like it. <laughs> some some Eric Steele. Probably Steel. Dick Steele. Like, Dick Steele. Uh, <laughs> that documentary, I, I felt like uh, toward the end, it, it, it sort of spirals like into like a eh. But the very beginning of that film, Jesus Christ, um, also about that film, that was based on an article in The New Yorker called The Jumpers. And they interviewed a guy, the only guy who survived oh, yeah. that jump. Too. And oh. that's what we were talking the other day about suicide. The one guy who jumped off that bridge and survived. He said that the second my feet left that bridge, he knew he had fucked up. Yeah. Like he knew that there was nothing in my life that calls for this sort of, this was a disproportionate response <laughs> to everything that was going on in my life to jump off what a, a fucking what, bridge. What a shitty time to have a moment of clarity. Yeah, what a shitty time <laughs> to be like, you know what? You Maybe would think I want to commit suicide in a unique way, not go to like, that's the equivalent of having your honeymoon at Niagara Falls. I'm going to kill myself on the Golden Gate Bridge. That's what everybody does. So it, what's the other? I, we have some Oakland people. What's the other bridge? The Oakland Bay Bridge? Is that what it's the called? Bay the Bay Bridge. There's also Coronado in San Diego. So Coronado. Yeah. So Shane is right. The Coronado Bridge in San Diego is also a suicide destination. And, and the, the signs all alt. the way up. Yes. Telling it's like you, the slam someone dance. Cares. Yes, someone cares for you. <laughs> yeah. Call this number and uh, but the the Golden Gate Bridge uh, at its heyday was having what one or two suicides a week. The Oakland Bay Bridge had it's a zero. Gr- it's when they came out with Groupons. <laughs> <laughs> hey, let's all kill ourselves because it's, it's cheaper. It's cheaper here. So um, yeah, it's, it's it's this sort of mystical thing to. Uh, there was a psychiatrist that was like, people think that they're jumping off the bridge into like this other dimension, or that is oh, with all the fog too, yeah. very uh, d- 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 cinematic. Yeah, it's, right. it's, 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 it's a belly flop of death. It's the belly flop of death, and then you see that you see the guys. They have the the the. the I, I think it's the Coast Guard or the Bay Patrol or whatnot. They have people just stationed <clears throat> in hazmat suits. Just waiting yeah. for someone to fucking jump off this bridge, and he, they go, well, "You, when we pull up these bodies uh, that have jumped off this bridge. It, there's nothing graceful. Yeah. It's like hitting cement. Yes, yeah. it is like hitting cement. Ugh. The thing I remember because I've never thought about this in years watching it. Um, it was when they were tracking a guy walking back and forth and like he's gonna jump. He's gonna jump. And they just kept watching him and they're like, we can't do anything. Yeah. He could probably sue them if they tried to stop him, but he's going to jump. And then eventually I think that was one of the things where he just kinda like 
leaned over. Oh, that's just, the guy uh, in the all black. He uh, he had the most graceful leap uh, <laughs> of all of them. I was looking at it differently than style. The but. style. <laughs> I mean, he did a beautiful, great Lugatus. Uh, is, is Lugatus still alive? Speak of death. Uh, I, it it yeah, seems yeah, like I he died. on a TV show. Oh, no, it's uh, uh, Mark Spitz that died. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, yeah, I, The Bridge. The Bridge was one of the first documentaries that were just, just absolutely compelling to me. Um, and it was, and it was the, one of the first documentaries that it was, it was, I don't know if it was inspired by the, uh, that article, the jumpers, but I read articles every day and I'm like, I want to do a documentary with this journalist. And I got to do it on action part. And I don't know why not more film directors are teaming up with journalists to tell these like amazing stories. Uh, but yeah, uh, but I thought, I thought I could have made the bridge a lot more intriguing toward the end. Okay, so uh, this podcast uh, went long and fantastically, so we're cutting it there, and you can pick up part two with Chris Charles Scott in his uh, his new documentary. Check that out, Class Action Park on HBO Max. Uh, part two, coming your way on Patreon. Thanks for listening. Bingo, take us out of here. Okay, bye-bye now. <laughs>